Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom arrives this year at a turbulent time in gaming. As new releases continue to arrive with a myriad of technical hiccups, the excitement of diving into a brand new game has become increasingly muted. Even Nintendo published titles are not immune. Games such as the recent Pokemon titles have had unfortunate technical flaws themselves. So when the latest entry in the Zelda series promised to be bigger and better than ever before, skepticism is warranted, at least when it comes to technical performance. After all, the previous game, Breath of the Wild, as brilliant as it was, struggled to maintain a consistent frame rate across its massive world. Between that and the razor-sharp pre-release trailer, we wondered if Tears of the Kingdom might in fact be too big for the Switch. Which is exactly what we're here to discuss today. In this video, we'll explore the visuals of Tears of the Kingdom, comparing and contrasting them with the prior game, while revealing the state of its image quality and frame rate along the way. Worried about those pre-release frame rate issues? The final game may surprise you, so let's dive in. The Legend of Zelda series is known for constantly reinventing itself, finding new, interesting ideas to push the medium and concept forward. In many ways, I'd imagine the task of making a sequel to one of these games an unenviable one. The weight of expectation and historical importance cannot be understated, and as a result, direct sequels in the series have remained relatively rare. And by direct sequel, I mean those that build upon the foundation of a prior game. These do exist in the series. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask and The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds both follow in the footsteps of their highly regarded predecessors, while also offering fresh new ideas that have captivated fans of the series. Such is the case with Tears of the Kingdom. Make no mistake, this is a direct sequel to 2017's Breath of the Wild, but contrary to fears, it's not a retread. Tears of the Kingdom builds on a strong foundation and takes the concept to the next level. It's bigger in just the right ways, with more carefully designed sequences and environments to explore, satisfying my desire for proper Zelda-style dungeons with real level design. You'll revisit Hyrule, but there's so much more to this world, both above and below. You see, this is one of the major changes in the design. Breath of the Wild focused exclusively on the lands of Hyrule but Tears of the Kingdom takes players up into the sky to explore beautiful floating ruins and below the surface into a subterranean region. Crucially, the game world remains just as dynamic. Wind blows, fire burns, and light bounces, but new features enhance this already gorgeous presentation. For instance, a new procedural cloud system has been implemented to better support the skies we'll be exploring. The main difference here is that the player can now pass in and around the clouds, so it feels like there's proper depth, even though the clouds themselves are still billboards. Much like Breath of the Wild, Tears retains volumetric lighting and light scatter, often using them to fantastic effect, while inclement weather can be startling. The feeling of being caught in a thunderstorm, with lightning that casts shadows with each strike, creates a powerful mood. Really, what makes this game so impressive is the scope, fidelity, and interactivity of it all, especially for a portable system. Link can travel seamlessly from the sky ruins down to the surface, with no loading screens or major hiccups. The world uses a dynamic time of day system, something I'm not always a fan of, but it works really well here, especially when combined with actual bounce lighting via radiosity. Note how the green of the grass transferred to the nearby tree trunks in this scene. Or here, look at the horse's posterior as we cross the bridge. The green tint collected from the grass changes color as soon as we transition to the wooden bridge. And everything is governed by realistic physics simulation as well. The wind simulation is extremely robust, affecting objects around the world to varying degrees based on their material properties and weight. Now this was already used in Breath of the Wild, but it's still one of the best implementations I've seen in recent times. New to Tears of the Kingdom, though, is the Ultra Hand feature. Expanding on concepts from Breath of the Wild, this new power-up allows Link to physically manipulate objects in the world and fuse them together to create larger objects. Combined with the new Zonai device system, you can build all sorts of powered contraptions, all governed by the game's physics system. 
And honestly, at this point, I feel as if I've only scratched the surface, and I'm extremely curious to see what others will build when the game is released. The thing that really makes Tears of the Kingdom and its predecessor so special is the interplay between all these various systems. Even just the basics. Grass reacts to Link, but Link can also swing his sword to cut it down in the Zelda tradition. If you build a fire and then light your torch, you can then set it ablaze. And what of those trees? Well, you can run up to them, chop them down, and the resulting log will actually roll downhill, controlled by the game's physics simulation. If you drop this log into a body of water, it will float. And that same trunk can be used to create special vehicles if you wish. Certain atmospheric effects even behave in ways that we rarely see in modern video games. For instance, the fog that swirls around the caverns react to Link's movements in a surprising way. Just look at that. This is all basic cause and effect in action, but it's not especially common in most open world games today. Running around The Witcher 3, for instance, which is a very different game, of course, Geralt's movement has minimal impact on the grass, if you slash at a tree, it will never fall, and random objects in the environment lack any sort of physics simulation. It's basically window dressing, and it is the norm for most open world games. Zelda offers the level of interaction and physics simulation similar to what we saw in games like Crisis or Far Cry 2, something which I have sorely missed in many other games. Simulating these elements is taxing, however, especially in the CPU, and I'm impressed that Nintendo were able to pull it off at all. How well they pulled it off, though, is something we'll discuss during the performance segment. In fact, maybe we should get to that now before we begin making comparisons to Breath of the Wild. I imagine the state of image quality and performance is one of the more pressing questions after all. So firstly, recall that Breath of the Wild relies on a dynamic resolution scaling system with a ceiling of 1600 by 900 and while the performance was improved at the latest patch, it still exhibits drops in performance, right? Tears of the Kingdom is similar in many ways, but it does take some steps to improve the overall presentation. Now, 900p remains the primary goal in docked mode, but this time Nintendo seems to be using AMD's much maligned Fidelity FX Super Resolution, FSR1 specifically. This is used to reach 1080p, complete with mild contrast adaptive sharpening. If you look closely, the image does appear slightly sharper than in the prior game, but there's also a subtle edge ringing to everything. What makes this interesting, however, is how dynamic resolution manifests. In some cases, the game changes its internal resolution based on the camera speed. For example, if you rotate the camera in place, you may notice a change in the sharpness and clarity of the scene if you watch closely. That's because the resolution will drop to around 720p while the camera is in motion, but returns to 900p the second it stops. Now, it doesn't always drop resolution, mind you, but it is a common occurrence throughout the game. The same is true in portable mode, where the max res seems to be 720p, which is the native resolution of the Switch's screen. The game really looks exceptionally nice on a Switch OLED. I also want to briefly mention the cutscenes. Now, we can't show these in this pre-release video, but some of the main cutscenes are unfortunately rendered out as low bitrate video files. It winds up looking worse than your typical 1080p YouTube encode even. Thankfully, most scenes are real time, but when the FMV pops up, you're definitely going to notice. Of course, how the game performs is perhaps even more important, and the result is surprising. So when the initial previews were released, it was clear that the frame rate was not completely stable, and many of those previews noted this. When I got my hands on the initial review build of the game, this was consistent with my own experience. Now, I didn't get a chance to capture it here as I was still in the US, but even during the game's introduction sequence, the frame rate was constantly dropping to 20 frames per second, thanks to its double buffer V-Sync. It occurred often enough that I would have considered this a huge problem. Then, a patch dropped. Now, I don't often expect much from patches these days. Performance promises rarely pan out, after all, but in this case, it's a game changer. Nearly every instance of major performance loss has been corrected, resulting in a game that now holds very closely to the 30 frames per second target. Nearly the entirety of my video capture managed to maintain a solid 30 frames per second, at least in most instances, which for the Switch running a game this vast and emergent is downright impressive. 
Now it's not 100% perfect mind you, and I did find ways to trigger a drop in frame rate. In most instances, it's the result of using the ultra hand feature. When you first toggle this in a busy area, especially the frame rate is sure to dip. And when it does, it drops straight to 20 FPS. Again, thanks to the use of a double buffer V-Sync. The benefit of double buffering, however, is more responsive controls. And since the game hits 30 FPS most of the time anyway, it does feel better than it would with a triple buffer setup. It kind of reminds me of more old school games in some ways. You know, the slowdown that only occurs in busy scenes. The kind of thing you might anticipate in an old school side-scrolling shooter. Like in those games, Zelda is otherwise smooth in terms of frame pacing and lacks any significant stutter or hitching. It may only be 30 frames per second, but it's largely very consistent. Now, if you combine the aforementioned Ultra Hand feature with the most demanding areas in the game, however, you can definitely get some serious drops. Kakariko Village, for instance, was one of the original game's weak points, and that's still the case here in Tears of the Kingdom, especially with Ultra Hand enabled. The frame rate simply comes crashing down. But again, the frequency of these dips remains relatively low in the grand scheme of things, which is critical. Compared to the preview build, it's clear that these pockets of slowdown are much less intrusive than before. The only real bummer here is that it means the unpatched version on the physical cartridge is likely to have these performance issues as well, which is a bummer for long-term ownership should Nintendo ever shut down the patch servers. With that said then, let's look at some comparisons to Breath of the Wild. After all, much of that game's version of Hyrule is still available in Tears of the Kingdom. Nintendo has opted to build on the work done in Breath of the Wild rather than redesign everything from scratch, something they also did with Majora's Mask, which shares some of the technical underpinnings with Ocarina of Time. That doesn't mean there haven't been some improvements to Tears of the Kingdom. The improved cloud system, for instance, is new and welcome. This plays a critical role in establishing atmosphere while exploring the Sky Islands. Alas, if you saw the game's original trailer some years ago, most of the rendering improvements we had anticipated have not really materialized in the end, and it winds up feeling largely similar. The most significant visual improvements are all found in the lands of the sky and the underground, neither of which exist in the prequel. Beyond the cloud system though, one of the first things I noticed while trying to compare the two games is the change in position of the sun. Even when the time is synchronized between each game, the position is completely different. This impacts the direction of the shadows cast by the sun. But even with a rough comparison, I do feel that the shadow quality is slightly improved in Tears of the Kingdom. That's not to say that the shadows are clean, mind you, they're still rather noisy and low resolution, just slightly less so than Breath of the Wild. I also get the impression that the LOD distance has been expanded slightly in this new game, Watch the horizon closely and you should see grass and objects popping into view more often in Breath of the Wild than in its sequel. Beyond this, the increased sharpness is also noticeable if you look closely. Perhaps FSR is actually acceptable in this case. Alas, the dynamic weather eventually broke synchronization between the two, but it's still interesting to see them side by side. One thing that became clear during my capture session is a change to the state of the world. You see, when comparing the two, I often found myself bumping up against barriers in one game or another. For instance, I had little issue crossing in front of Hyrule Castle and Tears of the Kingdom, but in Breath of the Wild, I incurred the wrath of the eight-legged guardians patrolling the same area, making comparisons rather difficult. Conversely, while exploring Kakariko Village, changes to the town made it impossible to cross a certain threshold in the new game. I should know that neither of these things are really spoilers. The real changes to Hyrule are far greater than anything I've shown in this video. Of course, given the size of Hyrule, you'll probably be making use of the fast travel feature, and in this case there has been a slight boost to loading times in the new game. In most cases, Tears of the Kingdom loads slightly faster, which may be the result of optimizations related to the larger world. Oh, and another thing I wanted to note, Tears of the Kingdom makes full use of 5.1 surround sound, something you can never take for granted on the Switch. 
This is especially important given the environmental focus. The sound of rustling trees with soft piano notes echoing out is immensely satisfying. The soundtrack is phenomenal at building on the work started in Breath of the Wild, and it's easily one of the most sonically pleasing games in the franchise. And that's not even touching on the main theme for the game, which is simply wonderful. So with all that said, I think we have a solid picture of Tears of the Kingdom's state of launch. Given the power, or lack thereof, available to Switch developers, I think it's fair to say that Nintendo has delivered an impressively polished, complete game that looks and runs better than I ever expected. In fact, aside from the pre-patch performance woes, the experience with the game has been exceptionally positive. I encountered no bugs or unexpected behavior, despite the complexity of its simulation, and everything just feels so meticulously crafted. With the state of big AAA releases these days, playing something this polished and complete right at launch is extremely satisfying. Now if we circle back then to our original question, it's fair to say that Tears of the Kingdom is in fact not too big for the Switch. But that doesn't mean there isn't a caveat here. It doesn't quite measure up to those original trailers, something we can't entirely ignore. And that's why I'm of two minds in this final release. Yes, it is really impressive for the Switch hardware, but at the same time, I sure would have loved experiencing this on a more powerful machine. Clearly, that's not in the cards right now, but those original trailers showcased visuals beyond anything we see in the final game. So that's something to think about. Now, without going into too much detail, I do want to talk a little bit about the game, and I want to say that it surprised me in a good way. Breath of the Wild is extremely well made, but honestly, I never enjoyed it as much as other people. Large open worlds just don't do it for me, and it felt like the game was too heavily focused purely on that aspect. Tears of the Kingdom retains this element, but all the new scenarios you'll play through feel a lot more crafted in a way that the Titans never did. So you have this contrast between emergent open world gameplay with more designed dungeon-like segments. And that juxtaposition makes this a lot more appealing. Without saying too much more, let's just say that this game takes things a lot further than Breath of the Wild ever attempted. But I'll leave it there for now. Hopefully you found this video useful, and if you did, be sure to let us know, and we'll see you next time.